Every believer should know their doctrine. They should know their Bible. It will lead to life. It'll lead to confidence. You will not be easily attacked by the, by the devil. You will have a clear conscience because you'll know it's true. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. <clears throat> Verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, which is it, which it is equipped uh, when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it guides us into all truth. It is bread. It strengthens us to live for your glory. It not only strengthens us, God, but again, it guides us and shows us the way we should go, Lord. We pray that your word would always be the foundation of this church. It would always be the light that leads the way forward, not the cunning, deceitful schemes of men, or any worldly idea, but pure truth from your word. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen. So two years ago, East River uh, began to meet for public worship in the Batavia Armory. First time we had ever met was, I believe, the 4th of December. And five months before that, my wife and I had met with David and Becky Pryor in Hyde Park uh, to make sure they were committed to this church plant. As I recall, we got uh, fried chicken. It was really messy and kind of awkward, um, but it, it was good. Uh, David and I planted a church together way back in 2006 in um, uptown Cincinnati over by UC. And previous to that, uh, David had led worship in a youth Bible study that I taught. He was like 14 years old. He, he would dress like a, like a punk rocker. And it was pretty hilarious. I, I, of course, had bleached blonde hair back then and dressed like an idiot as well. But uh, there are pictures, and they are really funny. Um, needless to say, I uh, trusted the priors, and a church plant team, the, the leadership team that launches a church, has to be made up of people you can trust when things get hard uh, because they inevitably do in a church plant. Uh, so having the priors committed, we we're, were off to the races. Uh, and I do remember telling David back then, we had tons of conversations. We, I, I don't even remember which one of us coined the name. I just remember that it was like, there was like 20 other names that I'm so glad we didn't go with. But we had lots of talks. Uh, and I remember telling him that if we could get 75 solid people um, in the church, it would be a huge success and we'd be able to make a big difference in Claremont County. And that is what I had envisioned and was more than anything excited about. So my mind was blown two years ago when 135 people showed up for our first worship service at the Armory. I mean, it was amazing. 
And it was obvious that the Lord was blessing us and was doing something much bigger than, than we ever imagined. But it is easy to start off well and finish incredibly poorly. It happens all the time. Uh, this is my second church plan, as I said. And the first church plan I did happened during a sort of church plant craze in the early 2000s. It was really hip to plant churches back then, especially in the city. Everyone was in the city for the city, which was really in the cool to be cool. That's all it was, you know. And uh, I saw more than a few churches swell to hundreds of people, some of them like in the first year. And that wasn't normal back then. You know, these churches would get to three, 400, 500 people in their, their first year and only to no longer exist in year two or three. I mean, that happened left and right uh, back. It was uh, the Acts 29 movement was a big part of that, but there, were, there was a, a big movement in church planning through the Southern Baptist Convention, through NAM, North American Mission Board. Uh, the PCA had a ton of money where they, they had $400,000 set aside per church plant in any college town. So $400,000, and a lot of those churches came to nothing because what makes a church is not money. Money matters, but not as much as some other things. So uh, the reality is they say something like 80% of church plants fail in the first five years. People debate that exact percentage, but here's, here's what we know for sure, is that a majority of church plants that start are no longer in existence within five years, at least here in the States. It's how it's been for a real long time. Now, why? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but I think the, there's two main components lacking in those failed church plants. First, a successful, a successful church plant requires a plural shared leadership of men who have, I just say, three C's, character, competence, and chemistry. You have to have all three. You can't, can't just have two of them. Character and uh, competence matters more than anything, but if you all don't get along, the vision's gonna come really quick. You need men you can trust uh, that trust each other. And so men with ability and virtue that can get things done as a team. So if you think about Jesus, he sent him out two by two. But more importantly, we have a model in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul always planted church, churches as part of a team. And so he would come in, he'd have a couple people with them, he'd preach the gospel, a group would be gathered, and then uh, he would leave behind uh, Titus or Timothy to help establish officers in that church. And then later he'd come back through and strengthen those churches. Uh, there's a reason for that. One man with one set of gifts will rarely plant a healthy church. The church will take, be very uneven. It will take on his personality, uh, the, good, uh, the good stuff and the bad stuff. So a healthy church plant takes, it takes elders. So you have to have that church plant team. You got to get that right from the get-go. The second component is a bit more controversial, as I ultimately think it's not just as important, but probably even more important. And what that is, is a clear and compelling, realistic vision for the church. Now, why is that controversial? Maybe some of you don't like the word vision, and that's why. It's because the church has seen a lot of nut job visionaries come and go and leave a pile of burning rubble in their wake. Lives ruined by men who made grand promises and instead delivered uh, disillusion is what they delivered. Dietrich Bonhoeffer did a fantastic job at describing these sort of men in his book, Life Together. Uh, he called these men visionary dreamers who peddled wish dreams. And he wrote, God hates visionary dreaming. It makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own law, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of the brethren. He acts as if he is the creator of the Christian community, as if his dream binds men together. When things do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. When his ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. So he becomes first the accuser of his brethren, then an accuser of God, and finally the despairing accuser of himself. And oh man, I have seen a lot of this 
Some guys come up, well, I was in a movement called the Emerging Church about 20 years ago. And basically the Emerging Church was a bunch of people saying that there is something wrong with the sort of commercialism of evangelicalism that came up in the 80s and 90s. And they were right in their critique. It really had become kind of mixed churches, right? Um, and so they started to question everything. But that was ultimately the problem, is that for many of them, they weren't looking for answers. They just kept questioning, 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 questioning. And there were some, some of us that had questions, but actually, what does the Bible teach? What should we do? And I remember seeing guys come up during that movement with some new way to do church, a new way to do Christianity. There was a really uh, big book at that time by Brian McLaren, a heretic, called A New Kind of Christianity, right? The main character was named Neo. If that sounds nerdy, it's because it was. It was terrible. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a better way uh, to do Christianity than all before. They're going to fix what's been wrong with the church for 2,000 years, supposedly. It's a new way to live in sublime Christian community without conflict and argument. It's pristine, it's inspirational, and it gathers a crowd, sometimes a big crowd. There's a guy named Rob Bell who's come and gone, another Salvation Army pile of heretics. Um, and Bell had this gigantic church up in Michigan. It was like 10,000 people. And it's slowly but surely, he revealed himself to be a false teacher. It, 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 it kind of, everyone suspected it, but it unwinded over time. These things come, and they draw a big crowd, but the crowd is united by what? By the vision of the visionary. And so as long as that vision proves true or compelling, it holds them together, but since it's not from the Word of God, it always spins out. It always falls apart. When reality settles in, it falls apart because it was only a wish dream that worked in the domain of the imagination, not in real life. The visionary dreamer... In those situations, then, he abandons the community he forged and says it's a failure um, because, you know, it wasn't because it was founded on unreality, but rather it was the people's fault, is what they'll say. The reason our church isn't awesome isn't because I came up with something stupid, right? It's because you all failed to fulfill it. They accuse them. And the, the evangelical world is full of churches like this and people that have been burned and disillusioned for that reason. And these guys just come and go. They'll just, they repeat. Once you've been in the church for about 20, 30 years, you realize it's almost like a cycle. It's like, well, there was Bill Hybels. And then we thought Mark Driscoll was cool. I didn't know that Bill Hybels once was cool. He always looked like an old fuddy-duddy to me because I was young when he was a big deal. But now Mark Driscoll, he's not cool anymore. He was just another Bill Hybels, wasn't he? These guys, they just cycle, repeat over and over and over and over again. So people are naturally suspicious of the visions of visionaries. So when someone, when someone hears me say vision is what matters, compelling vision, realistic vision is what matters, they get a little unnerved, and I don't blame them. But I still think a well-articulated, realistic Vision is the key to a church plan or any revitalization effort. And here's why. By vision, I simply mean a mental picture of a task completed. The first chicken coop I built, I did not have a blueprint. And that's why it looks the way it does. <laughs> I, I had a vision of a box that you could put chickens in. And that much I did achieve. Um, but I did not have a clear vision, and therefore I didn't know what I was working towards and the proper steps to take, right? So you have to have a blueprint or a direction you're heading. When something doesn't exist yet, when a church plan is being brought into existence, what is the church supposed to look like? Where are you going? That's what we mean by a vision. That's the simplest way to state it. Where are we going? And every, every, um, Every church has a creed, a vision, or a philosophy, a ministry. They just often exist by other names. And personally, I do not care what you label or name, name these things. You don't like vision, call it a plan, okay? That's fine. What I care about is that they actually are stated somehow and somewhere in writing so people know what they are. The most troublesome creeds, visions, and philosophies of ministries are those which are assumed 
but remain unstated. Those are the ones that get you in trouble. They allow elders and members with irreconcilable doctrinal and practical differences to believe they are united in mission, but in actuality, they are on a collision course with intense conflict. That's what kills most church plants, disagreements over where the church is going. It happens usually as they head into their third year. That's where we are. I've been thinking about this since day one. I don't know what it is about the third year for certain, but where I've seen most church plants die has been in their third year. I think that's where a lot of the initial excitement calms down, and you have to settle into the hard work of week-in, week-out Christian community. That's where you actually get to know each other. Here's the thing that's so terrible about Christian community is getting to know each other, right? So when you don't know each other, you can act like everyone gets along and there's nothing about the person that grates on you, right? But when you get to know each other, you start to grate on each other. You get a little annoyed. Right? Think of how, how you talk to your family when you're at home. You think I don't know? No one's told me. I just know. I have a family too. The more familiar you are with people, the more free you feel to say things. And uh, if you don't, like blood binds together pretty tight, right? Should be the waters of baptism that bind us even tighter, but it doesn't always play out that way, right? And so into two years, you start to get to know each other. And then that sort of excitement is running down and the honeymoon is over and now you have to actually work hard. Year three is where a lot of failed expectations come to surface. The church is not what you hoped it would be. I, I mean, for some people, believe it or not, believe it or not, David, for some people, this church is not prepper enough for them. It is not. You know how many of you have chickens and pigs and have just gone all in on this stuff? And some people come here and they're like, you're still not hardcore enough. Where everyone else is saying, these weirdos and their chickens. That's what everyone else is thinking, right? But they had some sort of expectation of like, I don't know, like a cooler Amish colony. I'm not, I, I don't know what they're after. And then there are some people that we weren't MAGA enough, right? When I said QAnon is false prophets that suckers believe. But I still voted for that guy, and I'm not sorry. And you're welcome to be a Republican here, and if you're a Democrat, we can talk. We need to talk. <laughs> Lives of babies matter. And it still, still wasn't magnet enough. And what do you think this church is? Do you think it's a church or some sort of club built around some other new affinity? So those people found a new church. Probably not. Probably not. Probably still looking. And then you'll find some people find out that they don't have the position that they think they'll have. You know how many, it hasn't really been a problem in this church, praise the Lord. But I remember when I planted my first church, I was really young and I shouldn't have planted a church. But man, there was always older guys that would show up and want to mentor me, Right? If you're such a great mentor, why are you this, this little small loser church plant, right? You're there because you see me green and you see an opportunity to get up and teach. That's exactly what it is. I cannot tell you how many of those guys show up at churches and think they're called to be pastors. Really? Well, well what's going on until this moment? Why has no one else recognized the gift? Why are you floating from church to church? How'd that happen if you're so gifted? And then these folks, when they find out, like, we want to see your character proven. I don't want to get to know you. I don't, don't just care how smart you are. I want to get to know you. Then those people get really mad. I thought I was promised a role here. No, you were not. When did that happen? Or perhaps it's just a claim that the church has departed from its original vision. That happens a lot, too. This isn't what I signed up for, you know? And maybe that's true. Maybe it is. And again, if the vision is stated, you can know. If it's written down somewhere. If the doctrine's written down, if someone's departed from the doctrine, someone can go look at the doctrine and say, this is what you said you're about, and now you're doing something, and that's a contradiction. But then again, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it didn't depart. 
And that's why you need to have your doctrine, philosophy of ministry, and vision stated somewhere. Doctrine is what we believe. Philosophy of ministry is how we get it done. And vision is where we hope to go by God's grace. That's why we have an annual sermon that I put on my schedule, and I always put State of East River Church. That's what this sermon is. It's the State of East River Church, but we're calling it a confessional community, and I'll explain that in a second. It's to keep us united and focused, working together at the same goal. So what is the vision of East River Church? I'd sum it up this way. We've, we've worded it else in other ways, but this is the way I thought about it th- these past couple weeks. We are working to establish an intergenerational, confessional community of believers who individually and as households engage our local culture. An intergenerational, confessional community of believers who individually and as house, a household are engage our local culture. This isn't a new vision. It's not creative. I, I don't want to be an innovator. Not in church. In business, fine. Not in church. This isn't a wish dream. This is just historical, biblical Christianity. And it's founded in our passage. And I just want to point out a couple things from the passage. If you look at verse 1 through 6, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. So in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, uh, Paul lays out a lot of abstract doctrine or theology of what God has done for his people. Then in chapter 4, he has that, I therefore. And it's a pivot where he turns to now explain how you live out that doctrine in practice. Hence, when Paul says, therefore, he's saying, here's what you do with it. And every church has to do that. That's a problem with Reformed churches. They have no therefore, usually. They, They just talk lots and lots of doctrine, but never transition to how you live it out in your life. So he's calling them to live out together in humility. You see that bearing with one another in love, well, you have to bear with one another, right? That means sometimes being in community is hard. You can't just be with people you always like all the time. As we get to know each other, there'll be things about each other that we like less. But then you get over a hump where you really get to know each other. It's kind of like the irritating things that your spouse does. You know, that you come to appreciate them, even though it's like at the same time, kind of nails on chalkboard. Um, but you, you'll get to know each other. You have to bear with one another love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So what unity? The spirit and the bond of peace. It's a unity that comes from the work of the Holy Spirit who unites us together in truth. That's the key. Right? You see this whole... Uh, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's the truth of the gospel, not merely secondary doctrines. A lot of churches start where they kind of have a boutique of secondary commitments. So we're the, we're gonna, we all home birth our kids and we're gonna talk to you about placentas and make you uneasy. And we're all gonna homeschool and it's all gonna be this particular curriculum. And if you don't do that, you probably hate your kids. Um, and we're all going to listen to the same music, even though this music's pretty bad. It's not very good, but we're all going to pretend like it's awesome. And we're going to dress like prairie muffins. We're going to do all these things. It, you can do that. I mean, I, the same thing happened in Calvary Chapel. I was in Calvary Chapel, and the, it was founded by a bunch of hippies. And during the, um, the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s, so Pastor Chuck He would always, Chuck Smith was the big guy in the movement. He'd always wear a Hawaiian shirt, not in church. He wore a suit on Sundays. People were always shocked by that. But when he wasn't preaching, uh, he would wear a Hawaiian shirt. And then suddenly, all the preachers in Calvary Chapel out in the Midwest, during the depressing, dark days of February, are wearing Hawaiian shirts in their pulpit. 
Why? What does that have to do with anything? It's so strange. And so then you get these people that they have all these cultural artifacts that bring them together, these secondary things, things that have value. Don't, don't misunderstand my use of secondary here. I just mean it's derivative from primary things. You, you don't have the primary thing, you won't get it. The primary thing is where the water comes from. We're talking about downstream here, okay? You see them, they build churches around shared affinities, things that everyone kind of likes, like chickens and prepping and guns or whatever. That's not what Paul is saying here. You have to be built on the cardinal truth of Scripture. That's where the unity is, right? One body, one spirit, just as you're called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. That's the source of our oneness, these truths. We've been called together to serve one God in truth. Churches who have a vision which is anything less than that are doomed, and they deserve to be doomed. The quicker they die, the better we are. The statement of one Lord, one faith, so on, it feels like a confession or a creed. So creed meaning just a belief statement. Confession is, uh, when we hear the word confession, we usually think of a, a formal statement um, admitting that one is guilty of a crime, right? But it also is a statement setting out a set essential religious doctrines. These are the doctrines that you confess, that you hold to above all things. So when I say we are to be a confessional community of believers, I'm saying that we are to build our unity and community on a commitment to essential doctrines. But you have to ask, what are those essential doctrines? What are they? And a lot of churches will say, we have no creed but Christ. And you say, well, so you agree with the Mormons on Christ. Well, no, the Mormons say that Jesus is just like a human that got godlike. Okay, so Jesus isn't God. Well, no, he is God. He's not human, though. Well, no, he's human, too. Well, so is he part God? No, he's all God. All, he's 100%. God, 100% man, oh, the hypostatic union, as laid down in the creeds and confessions that explain us. So you're going to end up having a confession. A, a confession is when you take doctrine that's taught throughout Scripture and you synthesize it into a summary statement so you can sum up, like, who God is, who man is, uh, what is man's problem, how does man have that problem solved, the way of salvation, what is our destiny, our destiny is to be apart from our body from a time, and then at the end of the age, to be resurrected and brought back together with our body in perfect holiness. What will happen at the end of the time? God will judge all, the quick and the dead. Some will go to hell forever, and some will be united with God uh, perfectly in a community that never, ever ends, right? These are essential doctrines. We have to pick what we're going to focus on, and... Uh, so what is that? Well, we have them stated in our doctrinal standards laid out on our website. We want you to know what we believe. I don't want you to have to guess. So we put them there. They are, um, this is one place you can get them. This, I got this back in seminary. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms, a little black book. It's not, it's got tons. That's all scripture down there. So it's not, it's not the IRS code. It might kind of look like that to you at first. But it wants... It's, it's, it's a, a simple statement of what we believe the Bible teaches. The cool thing about the Westminster Standards, here's why I like them. They're, even though they're old, 1640s, you basically had a bunch of Presbyterians, a bunch of Anglicans, and a bunch of con Congregationalists, which is kind of like predecessors in some way to our, our modern Baptists. And they all got together, and uh, they, they met in committees and argued and fought and we're able to come up with a consensus document that says, here's what we believe about salvation, about God, about man, about the end of the ages, and all that. And as you look at it, it's something that it's, it's been popular and it's united lots of different denominations because it was the, some of the smartest people, some of the smartest people ever came together and argued and fought. And uh, I like to go look at one of the answers, like on sanct what is sanctification, and try to come up with a better answer. I did it. I did it when I was in seminary, like, can I improve this? And the answer is I was not able to, right? It is awesome when someone's already done that work for you. 
Someone has already laid it down. Now, what's most important is that you see the truth that they summarize in Scripture and you can demonstrate it. Because you don't want to replace the Bible with a man-made document. But even this sermon I'm preaching to you right now is man-made. I put these words together to try to explain to you what the Bible teaches, okay? And so you use these things. So these are the things that we're committed to at this church. We're not going to move from any of them, right? 100%, unapologetic about all of it. Now, does that mean you have to agree with all of it to be a member here? No, not at all. Um, One of our, uh, we have eight foundational commitments, and one of them is we are committed to a unity found in a generous orthodoxy. And here's how we explain it. Christian unity must be rooted in a shared commitment to biblical truth. However, not all doctrines are equally clear. Some are black and white, others are more debatable. The word orthodoxy means correct teaching. It refers to the core indisputable doctrines of the Bible. When it comes to membership at East River, we focus on a shared commitment to a generous orthodoxy. In other words, there is room for doctrinal differences and even friendly debates as long as it doesn't undermine these core doctrines. So that's, that's our commitment. If unity, um, so that when you come to our, when we do our membership class, we basically say, here's the basics that you have to agree with. But here's what we believe on other things. And if you want to know, you can go look at it. Now, the question is, if uh, unity is founded on these essential confessional truths, how do we come to know it? Well, look back at our text. Look at verse second half of verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led hosts of, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descends is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now what this is, is a picture that Jesus came down in the incarnation to wage a battle against sin, death, and the devil. So he descended down to the lower regions. That's not like him freeing a bunch of spirits from a place in the middle of the earth. People will teach you that. That's not what it's talking about. It's literally talking about his incarnation, his humiliation. We know that because it's contrasted with his ascension into heaven. So then he ascends into heaven to the throne, right hand of the throne of God, And this is a picture of just what happens when a victorious king goes out, destroys an enemy, gets all the spoils from war, and then he comes back into his kingdom, ascends up to his throne, and he gives out gifts that came from that battle. So Jesus has been victorious over sin, death, and the devil, and now he has gifts to give his people, his church, those that belong to his kingdom. Now, what are those gifts? Well, it's the ministry of various church offices. That's the gift that he he gives us. And we call them offices because they have official duties. It's something that you're appointed to. So sometimes you'll hear elders and deacons referred to as officers because they have an office that uh, that represents their responsibilities. So the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church uh, in that God brought forth his written word through them. So he moved the apostles and prophets to speak his word. The evangelists are those God uses to establish new works through the preaching of the word. So they're kind of like church planners. And you see uh, Paul, he operates in a lot of these sort of uh, ways. Then you lastly have pastors and teachers, and those are shepherds who feed the people of God with the word of God. So it's all about the word of God. That's what these ministries are. It's all about being taught and trained in scripture. And one thing that has really stood out to me over the last couple of years as I saw the church get thrown into upheaval and people move from one church to another is I was surprised um, by how uneven a lot of discipleship has been in other churches. So the way I imagine it, there's this terrible movie called The Lady in the Water by M. Night Shyamalan. And I just remember there's this one character in it for some goofy reason, he only lifted weights with one of his arms. She had this really big muscular arm, and everything else was normal. 
as I meet lots of Christians these days, I find them to be like that. They know everything about the end of the world, and boy, do they want to talk to you about the news, okay? Or they know everything about the civil magistrate and how, you know, they can, because of what went down, they can talk to you about Romans 13 on and on and on. Or they know everything about manhood, right? That's kind of like an area I'm known for, and they can talk about that. But on the whole, there's not a well-rounded uh, discipleship and knowledge of Scripture. And it's clear that the church is very has failed, I think, in its discipleship efforts by and large. And here's how we know. The church has plunged into apostasy across our nation, right? It has. It's like nuts. I mean, the number of people that think same-sex marriage, mirage, they think that that is, is uh, okay and moral it is crazy. We're watching big-name conservatives suddenly uh, get super squishy and start uh, uh, justifying same-sex marriage and, and, and being transgender and all this sort of stuff. They, they won't stand. They won't stand for truth. And they're rejecting all sorts of things. It's just everywhere. And we see that, um, that their people weren't studied enough, and the ones that were stood up and said something, and they got ran out of the church for being divisive. Being divisive for standing for truth. They got ran out. The purpose of these gifts of leadership are clear. It's that the saints, God's people, might be equipped for the work of ministry, that's service, so that the body of Christ be built up and expanded and strengthened. That's how they're to know these truths. And that's going to be our major focus in 2023. And so here's how we're going to do it. First, we hope to add at least three deacons uh, to free up the elders. So that's John Pryor, Andy Barnes, um, Zach Carter. We've mentioned that to you guys. Uh, and also add a fifth elder, uh, Vince Carter. And all those people, you'll get to vote on them if you're a member. That's going to be at our March 5th congregational meeting. Right now, we just have one congregational meeting a year to walk through budget stuff and to vote on any officers and any edits to our constitution and bylaws. So members at this church, those are the ways they exercise their authority. You approve the elders, and we can't change our constitution without you being involved. Uh, now, uh, you're not a member? No biggie. We, we, we're starting a membership class on January 15th here at the church building at 9.15. It'll be four weeks, and then we'll have a membership reception before that May 5th uh, meeting. That way, if you've been coming for a while and you're not a member and you, you want your voice to be heard, uh, in our church, you have a view to all things, of uh, a voice on some things, and a vote on a few things. So we want things to be transparent and you to be involved. So we'll have that membership class. We have three of those membership classes scheduled for next year. Um, and with these new deacons and elders, out, that'll give us added firepower to help us do more teaching. So we are starting Sunday schools in February. I am, it's happening. Like, I don't care what it looks like in that room. We're having Sunday schools. Um, we have to. It is time to do it. We need more time in God's word together, and our children need more time. It has to happen. It is a absolute priority for this church. Now, I want, after the service, I'll open up the doors, and you can go in there and look at the work that Hank and his team has accomplished. It's, it's pretty amazing. We are stuck a little bit on getting uh, a, a permits, drawings and permits approved, but Hank's got that moving forward as fast as we can. The next thing we need is we need to get the electrical work done in there. We need the construction to shut up the wall so your kids don't like lick metal and cut their tongue, right? Uh, you know, they'll find, they'll find the one nail in there wherever we stick it. I'm, I know it. Probably be one of my kids. But um, we got to close all that up. And then also, we really, if we're going to do that work, we, it'd be ideal to get the drop ceilings in a, uh, soon, uh, as long as the uh, HV, well, well, with our he heating and cooling we need in there. And that's going to cost money. There is $93,000 in our general account right now. This church is very disciplined on how we spend money. I get paid probably 80% less than another pastor that works my role in a church this size. And that's okay. That's, uh, that's, I'm very happy and well taken care of, thank you. But part of that is so we can get money into the work here. What we need 
is we need uh, some, some of you to help give a little more. Now, you guys have done really well, and I have no complaints, but it's just we can't drain the general fund um, out to, to finish it. So really, somewhere in the area to 30 to 50 grand would open that door up. So it's end of year. Can't take it with you. You don't want, you don't want Uncle Sam to get any of it. Don't give them any money that you don't have to give them. So if there's a consider giving to that, you can talk to Hank and I. There's a lot of different ways we can do it. But that also, what I want you to understand, it will open up the door to us catechizing our children. And that's what I want to talk to you about next. We're going to introduce two, two catechisms. So a catechism is a very simple way of teaching doctrine. So this is the first catechism. So my ki most of my kids know a bunch of these. But who made you? God. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things for his glory? How can you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why are you to glorify God? Because he made me and he takes care of me. So this goes through this 150 questions. If you want to know if your kids need this, go home and ask them some basic doctrinal questions. You want to be really humbled? Go ask any of your kids to explain to you what the gospel is. Do it. I do it. And every time, like, I'm like, Ugh. and when I, let's get this down and never do this in front of people at church. Um, but uh, this is a very helpful tool, a very simple tool to help you teach your kids doctrine. They must be discipled. They must be taught God's word. They must know God's truth. And when they're little, their brains are sponge. Do you want them to know the most powerful Pokemon card or this? Right? They're going to know the most powerful Pokemon. We got the Pokemon contingent here. We're always like on the edge of breaking it up. But 150 questions. Kids, this is not a coloring book until your mom gives it to you. Right? They're back there on the welcome table. Grab one of these and start to teach your kids. It is so easy to do this around the dinner table, right? We've got, we, you win prizes in my house when you conquer it. I won't tell you what it is because I don't want you to be bound to that. But, um, but yeah, you get one for this. And then uh, I'll, I'll tell you, if you memorize a larger catechism, I'll buy you a car. That's, uh, that is a real rule. Anyone that does it, I'm buying them a new car. But uh, uh, <coughs> so that's the first one. This is actually going to be worked into our, our Sunday school curriculum for the little kids. John's working on it. It's not going to be the main curriculum, but when your kids come to church on Sunday, when they start their Sunday school, they'll be asked a few of these questions, mostly just to help you, just to build it into the routine. The second one is the shorter catechism, and this is in modern English. This is more for adults. You'll benefit from this. Don't feel ashamed. Every time I go through it, I think that's a simple way to say it. But this is also a little more complicated, and very, and very helpful. We got our modern English, uh, and there's a bunch back there. And what we're going to do in our adult Sunday school, we're going to go through these questions. Over 28 weeks, we're going to go through all, all 107 questions. And the book that John and I, John Weiss and I will be working from, is this is this G.I. Williamson's, the Westminster Shorter Catechism Study Guide. I love this thing. Like For each question, there's like two pages. It's so easy for devotion. I love easy things. I love making things easy. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, and a lot of times we just make everything so complicated in discipleship and training that we just quit. That's why I love the carnivore diet. Now, that's, uh, people ask, like, is it just meat? It's just meat. Well, can you eat vegetables? Is the vegetable made of meat? Um, no. But I like anything I don't have to think hard about. Right? This is easy. Just read a couple of these things. So we'll use that. You don't have to have this, but I'll let you know this is where our curriculum's coming from. And so we're going to be doing that because we want you to know doctrine. I want you to know what it means to be sanctified and justified and glorified. I want you to know the Ten Commandments and the ethics that flow from them. I want you to uh, be well steeped in these things because that's the truth that we have to be founded on. That, that's the thing that will connect us together as a community and not make this just some sort of trendy thing that pops up, pushing back against masks and, and all the pan, uh, pandemic nonsense. I don't want that just to be what our church is. I want it to be something uh, that's founded on uh, what's good and true. And here's why it matters that you know these things. Going back to our passage, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, 
So teaching these things grows us up in faith and knowledge to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human, human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. That is what's happened. People cannot discern what's right and true anymore because they don't know what's right and true. And so every little crazy thing that pops up, every little uh, scheme they get sucked into, and as trends and fads over and over again, and that's why having old things and going back to old things keeps us from getting sucked into new lies that really are just old lies. That's what leads us into maturity. Take special note of 14, that no longer be children. Don't you want to be a mature believer? Every believer should know their doctrine. They should know their Bible. It will lead to life. It will lead to confidence. You will not be easily attacked by the, by the devil. You will have a clear conscience because you'll know it's true. Now, let me restate our vision again. We are working to establish an intergenerational confessional community of believers who individually and as households engage local culture. Intergenerational is key. One of the main reasons we want you to know and love the truth is so you can raise children to know and love the truth so that they can raise up grandchildren that know and love the truth. One thing we're seeing right now broadly is the church lose their children. They are losing their children in mass to the world. It is happening. They're being swallowed up by this woke demonic culture. And it is hard. Now, some of you have worked hard to be faithful. And, you know, sometimes an Esau is born. Sometimes a prodigal is born that does come back. Those things are outside of our control ultimately, but we should control everything that we can. And that is the discipleship of our children. This church will be a failure if I don't have a grandkid communing in it. That's my goal. My goal is I want to see this much bigger than me. And I want it to be much bigger than our initial members here. We want to help equip you. Now, one way we're doing that is through Sunday school. And we're also stepping up the quality of our youth gatherings. They're going to be here. We, we, I've planned them out through the whole year. The whole year is planned out already. But we also want to make sure you have the tools to do family devotion. And one of the ways, you know, I, I know so many gangster rap songs. It's, it's like shameful. And that's because I just rapped them when I was younger. So one of the best ways to know truth is through, through music, right? That's how we catechize. That's how our culture catechizes us, through music and pop cultural references. So David, Pastor Pryor, is going to teach you men and women 12 songs that anyone, anyone, guys, no matter how terrible you are, how painful your voice is, right, that anyone can sing around the dinner table. Classic hymns and psalms. Songs that he's chosen that will help you. And these are songs that we're going to uh, integrate into our Sunday worship. You'll have maybe one a week, but also in our men's studies, in our women's studies. And then we're having a men's retreat, women's retreat, and singles retreat this coming year. And all those things are going to be taught there because I remember when I first went to a Presbyterian church and everyone knew like 100, 100 hymns. They're like, what's your favorite hymn in the Trinity hymnal? I'm like like I could do something like that. Like, well, mine's hymn 100. What in the world is happening? People know the hymns by number? They did. It was amazing. They knew that stuff that well. What do I know? You know, I know the history of Yavin. That's a Star Wars reference. And if you know that, you're a nerd. Um, I know things like that that don't matter. But I didn't know what... Hymn number 100 was in the Trinity hymnal. But that'd probably be a lot better for my soul, wouldn't it? So we want you to know those things. 12, that is a low barrier to entry. We're going to do those. With the retreat, um, it's just one overnight for the men's and women and then the singles. This will give us more time to study together, but we'll also use those times to teach uh, these songs. And as I close up here, um, we also doing County Beaver Country again over Labor Day. I don't know if we'll do that every year going forward. We got one more in us this year with air conditioning. Um, but one of the outworking of our sort of County Beaver Country mindset at this church, we're very much focused on being local. <coughs> 
is the planting of new churches within four hours of Cincinnati. We, um, we, our missions moving forward will be 90% local. It's very clear that there's a need for lots of new churches, and we want to be an incubator church for new like-minded church plants. And I believe that, I sincerely believe that we can plant 10 to 12 churches in this sort of Appalachian region over the next 15 years. I think that is actually very attainable. Um, I think the Lord's stirring, We're already doing wonderful things through Silver City Church in Mount Sterling, which is our first daughter church, but there's other things happening. Now, by God's grace, this will give birth to a sizable alliance of local churches that can support huge generational projects, like seminaries and college. It is very hard to find a good seminary or college to send uh, to see our ministers trained at uh, or have our children taught. And that's going to that's gonna take more than one church. So that's, that really is the goal for our church, is to be a catalyst of regional renewal that will last generations. And it all flows out of a commitment to God's word and each other. I like how it ends here in Ephesians, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That is the goal of a healthy church, to be built up, uh, to build each other up, the whole body, right? It's not a pyramid with a guy like me at top. We're all part of the body, and the body needs each other. But we also need to know what we're working towards. What we're working towards is being a confessional community, a community of believers that are devoted to truth and seeking to live it out in their life in the whole culture that God's put us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you it's true. We thank you that you plucked us out of darkness and brought us into light, and you've given us a new appetite. And that appetite is not for lies and the tickling of our ears, but for the truth, the wholesome truth of your word that strengthens us, God that guides us, God. Lord, we pray we would love and study your word, that it would be on our minds all the time, to be on our lips, not just in prayers, not just in speaking, but in singing, God. We pray that our children would grow up knowing your word inside and out and knowing your truth inside and out, God. Strengthen us in this. Father, we pray you would protect them from the evil one and being snatched away by this corrupt culture. We pray that the culture of our home would be even more powerful, that it would be a holy culture, God, built on your word for your glory. Help us to be a church that's not into the fads that come and go, but are founded on your truth that is timeless. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.